Welcome back to Grand Prix Toronto. I'm Ben Sek. This is Jake Van Lunen. We've got some round six action at the modern tournament. <gasps> Dan Ward. Buggles. This is Colin Kong. Boggles? Yeah, yeah. Dan Ward loves his boggles. Perhaps more than anybody else. <laughs> He's a really big fan. He actually pronounces it bagels, which is incorrect, but for him it's correct. Yes, sir. And you know. <laughs> He is from he's he's from upstate New York, right? Uh, yeah, not too far upstate. Okay. He's like like twenty miles north of New York City. Okay, upstate, that, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> it, he's not one to say like bagels or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's not quite a Bostonian. Okay, Colin Kong is playing Burn, starting off with a Goblin Guide, not revealing a land. And yeah, now this matchup is a nightmare for Colin. Just an absolute nightmare. Yeah, wh wh why is that? I mean, obviously, you know, Dan's Ward's uh, plan is to f find an untargetable creature and then load it up with enchantments. Why is it particularly bad for Colin? So Colin can't target the creatures because they have Hexproof out of Dan Ward's deck, and Dan Ward has some enchantments that give his creatures lifelink, so it becomes incredibly difficult for Colin to keep up unless he's able to chain cards like a Targus Command or Skullcrack. Uh, for a number of key turns to w try to win the game that way. So Dan declines to actually play a uh, an enchantment aura on on his on his boggle, playing a uh, a core um, spirit, spirit dancer. Dancer, yeah. that's right. Okay, Colin following up his goblin guide with another goblin guide, flipping over a leyline of sanctity, but uh, that's not a land, so doesn't actually get it in his hand. This Horizon Canopy, though, is getting a little bit dangerous here for Dan. He's already taken three damage off of that. Okay, so a Spider Umbra on the Spirit Dancer. Uh, like, I, th I think uh, Dan played the Spirit Dancer so he could try and cycle into some land or maybe some of those life gain life gaining auras he talked about. Looks like the Spirit Dancer is going to be on guard duty. Um, Spirit Dancer actually gets plus two, plus two um, when it's enchanted. So currently, it starts off as 0-2, another plus 2, plus 2, so that's 2-4, and then another plus 1, plus 1 from the Spider Umbra. Yeah, so currently a 3-5 Core Spirit Dancer. Also, Denmar draws an additional card every time he plays an Aura spell with that Core Spirit Dancer on the battlefield. Okay. Roof Bolt suspended for Colin Kong. Colin, a little bit constrained in his mind, I mean, or a lot um, constrained. He, he only has... Uh, a single Sacred Foundry. So both players are playing with a little bit of a minor handicap. You know, Dan, uh, you know, if he's able to have a card like uh, Daybreak Coronet or something of the light here, which does not look like he does. Goes for another another aura in the form of Rancor. Yeah, and it's, it still failed to find something that costs one white or another land. Dangerous situation here. So... He's constantly tapping the Horizon Canopy. Obviously, as you said before, really you know hurting him. I think it's the third time he's he's tapped at this turn. So, almost an entire card like Lightning Bolt or Lava Spike equals three tappings there. Yeah, not what uh, not what the Boggle Sag is hoping to happen in this matchup. I mean, really interesting though because you know you look at the uh, the deck and. It looks like this is just the best matchup ever for Bogos on paper. They have four Leyline of Sanctity in their main deck. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so so, so um, the, the Core Spirit Dancer actually hit for seven. Um, with the enchantments, it really increased its, its power. What uh, Colin did was he couldn't really kill any of the two creatures in play with that Rift Bolt. So he put it, sent it to the dome. Um, he's still has, having a little bit of minor problems here. Um, but leaving back the Slippy Boggle probably to, to, to block here. Yeah, and I think what Dan's, Dan's goal here is to win the game on this turn. Oh, and, and he cast Spirit... Uh, Spirit Ward? No. Mar mantle. Oh, Spirit Mantle, which yeah. makes it uh, protection from creatures, and which meant that uh, Colin couldn't actually block yeah, yeah, that so. Spirit Dancer. So, uh, a messy game there. Those are some of my favorite games of Magic, though, where <laughs> neither person is really doing what they want to be doing, and you have to kind of work with what's available to you. Dan, you know, he was on the back foot, and he didn't really have a good way to, you know, stop what Colin was doing. He didn't have a good way to, you know, do different things. So what he decided was, okay, 
I've engineered a, a board state where I can kill my opponent over the course of two turns. I'm just going to do that, and I'm going to chump block with my Slippery Boggle when he attacks me with those Goblin Guides, and I'm going to force my opponent to draw land and have two one-mana, three-damage spells in hand. Mm -hmm. And if he doesn't have that, then I win, and his opponent did not, and he won. <laughs> okay, so, so Dan, as you, you were saying before, has a few um, auras that give lifelink. Daybreak Coronet. Um, that's the, the main one. It actually gives uh, lifelink but it's an aura that can only be played once there is another aura on that creature. Um, he could be playing a card like... Um, what is the name of it? Armadillo Cloak Soul card. Uh, oh, the... Uh, I don't... The green oh, Unflinching one. Courage? Yes, Unflinching there Courage. But he actually does not have that uh, main deck. He's like, In fact, he's a shoot it for Leyline of Sanctity main, main deck. This is a card that you see in Cyborg sometimes, but... Um, you don't see in main deck very often. Um, sometimes Bogles have it, but uh, what's the reason to have Leyline of Sanctity in your deck for? All right, so Leyline of Sanctity is a card that uh, has not been in the main deck of Bogles for very long. Last weekend, I believe it was Tommy Ashton posted an 8-2 finish at the Pro Tour playing Bogles, and he was playing four copies of Leyline of Sanctity in his main deck. Now, this card has a lot of different applications in the current modern format. You play against Scape Shift, they can't target you. You play against uh, a deck with a lot of discard spells. It really punishes them. You play against Storm. It's really hard for them to kill you. There are just so many things that Leyline does right now and so many matchups where when you put that into play on the very first turn of the game, it can kind of win the game or I'll, you know, give you a huge portion of the game right there on the, on the spot. It's a really powerful hate card, and the fact that you can play it in your main deck now, and it's powerful enough to play it in your main deck, and it still pumps your creatures that are enchanted with ethereal armor, it, it's one of the things that's kind of pushed Boggles back into the modern metagame. And I think this deck is a deck we're going to start seeing more of again in the coming weeks. Mm -hmm. And one of the main ways that uh, some players like interact with Boggles, like usually you'll have like Hexproof, so it's really, really hard to kill creatures, but um, uh, Liliana the Veil is a really, really strong threat to this deck because it can uh, force them to Diabolic Edict to sacrifice a creature. But mm -hmm. Leyline Sanctity prevents the player getting targeted instead of the creature, so they can't be targeted by uh, Liliana the Veil. That's precisely true. Yeah, it's another thing that it turns off that makes it quite good at protecting the Hexproof creatures. Okay, so point. On, on Colin's side, um, obviously we've seen some burn decks today. Uh, what are the tools that he has to really co combat the, the Boggle Menace? All right, so the most important card for Colin post-board is going to be Destructive Revelry. Mm -hmm. He has three copies of the card. It's really good. It breaks up Dan Ward's Voltron, if you will. His, you know, it, it takes away one piece of clothing from the Boggles, and then, you know, sometimes the, you know, if you take away the belt, the pants fall off too kind <laughs> of thing, you know, if it's a, a, an, a Daybreak Coronet. So... Uh, Destructive Revelry, definitely one of the more important cards here for Colin post-board. Dan Ward, uh, I think the most exciting card for this matchup on his sideboard has to be Dramokas Command. Ooh. Yeah, now, Dramokas Command, uh, it's a card that I'm not sure if everybody knows. It's from Dragons of Tarkir, so it's not too old. But um, one of the modes is uh, Prevent All Damage that target instant or sorcery or deal this turn, so it essentially counters a burn spell. Another mode puts a plus plus one counter on one of your creatures. Another mode makes somebody sacrifice an enchantment, and that's quite good against uh, Eidolon of the Great Revel. By the way, that's an enchantment. And uh, the fight ability, even quite good. Like, that is uh, just a tremendous card for this matchup. It almost feels like a green-white collective brutality. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely see how drawing that card is going to be pretty big. And he only has one, but if it's, if it's going to come out, it's probably going to be pretty impactful. So Colin starting the game on the right foot with a Lava Spike to the face. And Dan also responding with probably his best opening, a Glade Cover Scout. You know, when he's got a one drop that has Hexproof, that's, that's where he wants to be. Right. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if he, if he actually had Leyline of Sanctity, that would actually be pretty good, too. Um, if he didn't actually have it in his opening hand. Otherwise, we'd probably see it in play. Um, but a lot of the burn spells, they target the player. Okay. You see, it's uh, increasingly important to actually have basic lands against a lot of the burn decks because 
Saves you a bit of damage. Okay. A Griff Spoon and Ethereal Armor makes a uh, four power Glade Cover Scout. Coming in for four. Colin responds by casting Lightning Helix to Dance Face. Kind of negating most of the damage that happened that turn. But does not have a third land. Now, most of the, the cards that they play don't have... Oh, my goodness. Is that oh. a Spirit Link? It is a Spirit Link right on the <laughs> sideboard. This, this is a card that clearly is there for this kind of matchup. Okay. Colin has a skull crack to stop a lot of the, the pain of that. Um, though he's actually losing a lot of life now. I think he's being hit for a four. Um, and he, he better have a few more skull cracks up his sleeve. Otherwise, this is going to be a pretty short match. Yeah, I mean, if, if he does not have another way to prevent Dan Ward from gaining life here, another copy of Skullcrack, for example, then uh, Dan's going to be, you know, undoing multiple of Colin's burn spells with every single attack from that clay cover scout. Okay, so I think the, it's a, currently a three, four, five power Glade cover scout that has flying. It's five, four, I believe. Five, four, first strike. Destructive Revelry on the Spirit Link. This is the card that you talked about in between matches. Really stopped some of the, the pain here, actually preventing one damage because of reducing the Ethereal Armor bonus, as well as getting rid of the Life Link. Also super vital. Okay, so Dan is at six. So he's actually, you know, within two spells. So if this is a, like two com a combination of Lightning Bolts or Lava Spikes, Dan will lose, or at least as the board stands, he would. It looks like Colin might not have access to that because it seems that he probably would, have, would cast it this turn. Yeah, I imagine he'd just go for it right away. Um, um, also, a destructive revelry, which normally would be pretty good here, isn't going to actually be able to prevent enough damage because uh, actually it might... No, it, will, it would be yeah, just enough. If take it, the, the ethereal armor off, but it, it, Dan Ward has to draw like an actual blank also. Yeah, and it doesn't look like he has it in his hand. He, he definitely has some, a bunch of red spells in his hand. There's a white spell. So let's see what... what Path to Exile, Path I imagine, Exile. Then? Path to Exile is not very good here. Surprised he sideboarded the paths in. I guess they, they do kill the spirit dancers. Um, but it, it, Path to Exile is an interesting card to bring in because Burn, you really want all of your cards to do something every single time, and if Dan Ward doesn't draw Core Spirit Dancer, the Path Exile just kind of sits in your hand. It's not a card you want to really target Dryad Arbor with. <laughs> it's, pos it's possible that Colin's trying to represent a Deflecting Palm, but I actually think the Deflecting Palm, I'm not sure if it works against a Hexproof creature. I think you might need to target the creature. Interested to see if... Uh Dan is able to uh, figure it out, jam everything into the red zone. He's getting up to ask for Oracle text on Deflecting Palm. <laughs> oh, almost definitely, actually. <laughs> like, I think that that's, that's what I would be doing. Let's, let's, let's see if we can... Uh, I'm typing Deflecting Palm into Gatherer right now as we speak, so... Okay, actually we have it on, on screen here. The, Beautiful. the next source, the time is source <laughs> of your choice. We deal damage to you, prevent the damage. So it actually does not target the creature um, at all. So, so deflecting pump is going to be something that Dan's going to be worried about because if he deflects the Glade Cover Scout, he's going to prevent the four, the three, redirect it back to Dan. Dan is only going to be able to do one damage or whatever else he can, he can put on. Okay, so he's trying to... And he no. put a Rancor onto the Core Spirit Dancer. Colin actually didn't actually have a Deflecting Palm, but he was representing it. So yeah. he, was, the, the, he was just trying to make sure that he, uh, you know, covered every out. Yeah, and I mean, it's important. You know, you don't get many opportunities to make, like, what one would call, like, cerebral plays when you're playing Boggles <laughs> over the course of a weekend. So you really have to savor those as much as you can. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you want to you're just trying to be careful here. I mean, you, you know, when you have the, the game, like, in your hand, you don't want to let it slip. Okay, so D Dan Ward wins 2-0. 6-0 oh now. Yes. Dan Ward playing Boggles. Boggles. Boggles is back. Yeah, and he's a brewer. He is out here at the Grand Prix Circuit all over North America, and he is playing weird decks all the time. 
occasionally top eighting GPs with them. Top 16 in GP is pretty often. Yeah. Okay, so we're actually going to come in on game two. Uh, Lucas Ciao uh, versus Martin Eric Gauthier. Uh, Lucas on black green mid range. We saw him a bit earlier today. Um, and Martin Eric, he's playing Mardu Pyromancer, like a, a deck that did really well at the Pro Tour, at least in the hands of one mage. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Jerry Thompson made the finals with Mardu Pyromancer. Yeah, you know, the deck, uh, when you look at the bigger numbers from our Pyromancer last weekend, it had a, uh, had a pretty poor uh, day two retention rate. It had a very, very good top two retention rate, however. <laughs> I think there were four or five people playing the deck, so uh, the fact that Jerry made it all the way to the finals of the Pro Tour definitely proved that this deck is something to be reckoned with. Yeah, and, and Jerry was just, the, he, he played it in a way that I think not a lot of other players would play it, and we all know Jerry to be a, a massive like tuner and player and I wonder how much of the win percentage of this deck specifically is in the control of the player itself so uh, Martin Eric he led with a Thoughtseize removing a Dark Confidant from Lucas's hand Lucas okay taps his Twilight Mire for a Nile Spell Bomb Nile Spell Bomb pretty good against the Mardu Pyromancer deck. Obviously, that deck uses a lot of flashback spells, so pretty important. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, you, if you time it correctly, you can uh, make it so you can strand Bedlam Revelers in your opponent's hand. Right. Uh, which is pretty important when you're playing this matchup, I imagine. Okay. That's really the, the card that uh, punishes you for being a, a disruptive uh, like Thoughtseize Inquisition deck. Gautier won the ga first game. It's just a deck that grinds pretty well, especially because it has like you know some over-the-top plays with Bedlam Re Reveler, as you uh, said before. The eponymous Pyromancer enters play on Gautier's side. Collective Brutality from Lucas Seau, targeting the Paramensa and the Cold Guns Command. Really efficient use of his mana here. Exactly what he needs to be doing there. Um, it's interesting stuff. I mean, so... Tarmogoyf is one of the better cards in Lucas's deck in this matchup. It's a card we've talked a little bit about this weekend. It's a card that I think matches up pretty well against the modern format right now. There is Fatal Pushes in, in Martin Eric's deck, but uh, it's still, if you don't have one, those Fatal Pushes, it becomes much, much tougher to kill. Okay, the follow-up is a yet another young Pyromancer from Martin Eric. And one thing that's really hard for Lucas is he doesn't want to let Marn untap with a young Pyromancer. It, you know, just those tokens in general are going to provide a, a little bit of a headache. Uh, if Martin can't produce a bunch of them, it's not the end of the world. But it's just an advantage that you don't want to let your opponent get. Uh, Lucas is really hoping to like run away with this game to grind out extra cards with a card like Tireless Tracker. And then to strand things like Bedlam Reveler in Marn's hand. One of the things I saw um, with Jerry's play l last weekend with this deck was to actually not let the Pyromancer kind of like not get some amount of value. Uh, a lot of times I saw um, Jerry basically play Pyromancer and a spell that same turn. So even if it got killed, he would actually have gotten some sort of return. Um, I think that might, I mean, I'm not sure about this individual case, but like I, th I think it's, it's a play style that a lot of players would, who want to play Marudu Pyromancer should take, take note of because I think this deck is a deck that really tries, needs to grind every advantage. Yeah, more often than not, when we were watching the, the matches that Jerry played with this Marudu Pyromancer deck, I was noticing that he was you know, flashing back Faithless Looting very aggressively. He was uh, just playing the deck a lot differently than I think I might have. Uh, there we see it. 
Martin's fatal push able to deal with a uh, tireless tracker. Yep. He the fatal push was um, had revolt because of the fetch land, and then he follows up with a lingering souls, sporting some of those really cool foil tokens from Unstable. I think Lucas has had enough of Mutton Eric's graveyard, getting rid of some of the, the flashback cards. Yeah, and I believe Martin Eric, uh, he, his hand is almost empty, and uh, Lucas knows about a Bedlam Reveler uh, because of the collective brutality they played earlier. So playing that card makes it so that Martin is essentially out of gas. Martin has a big advantage on the board right now, though. Yeah, I mean, and... and there is some removal spells that, like there is a Maelstrom Pulse in Lucas's hand that can either get two tokens either type of token probably the flies if he chooses, chooses uh, to go down that route or the Pyromancer actually he's going to go for a little bit of uh, controlling Martin's mana getting rid of the Sacred Foundry which happens to be the only white source and here's where format knowledge really uh, comes into play. Uh, Lucas Yao recognizing, okay, my opponent may only have one source of white mana in their entire deck if I activate this Field of Ruin right now. Um, if I activate this Field of Ruin right now, then I might be able to strand a bunch of cards in his hand over the course of the game. And then he follows up with Thoughtseize, getting that last Bedlam Rivola, which he knew was in his deck. And... But Lucas loses that Maelstrom Pulse to a top-decked Inquisition of Kozilek, which is a little rough because now he's kind of empty-handed. He does have a clue to sacrifice if he, if he needs to, but he's facing down, you know, seven power plus... Oh, wow, what a, that's a really good top deck. Even though he's likely to lose the... Liliana in the next uh, turn, I mean, it, one soaks up a bunch of damage and gets rid of the recurring threat of the Pyromancer. Yeah, essentially uh, destroying the Pyromancer and gaining Lucas 4 here. Okay. So, doing one damage um, with the remaining elemental. I see. Post-board, Lucas does have multiple copies of that Liliana the Last Hope, so he could draw more of them. Oh, wow. It's like two big threats. Um, one, a Grim Flayer, and the next being a Tarmogoyf. I think we're doing a, a bit of a count. Um, we have Planeswalker, Sorcery, Artifact, Creature, Creature. Land, Land. The Field of Ruin. There's no instant. No instant. A very unusual situation to happen in modern. Five, no uh, five, five six Tarmogoyf. Going to be pretty effective at holding the ground, though Martin can keep pressuring Lucas with his two spirits. You know, uh, Faithless Looting, quite good there for Martin. Uh, with the Faithless Looting plus the flashback, Martin's graveyard is going to become quite large, and uh, he'll also have more action because his deck does, you know, use its graveyard to great effect. Here we see uh, Martin likely going to discard this Lingering Souls here because I imagine the only source of white mana in his entire deck was uh, killed by Lucas's Field of Ruin just a bit earlier. Yeah, luckily still gets a lot of value out of that. Obviously just uh, is able to still flash back the Lingering Souls despite not having any white mana. Uh, it's pr pretty likely that he attacks and he does bringing Lucas down to seven. So really putting Lucas on a two turn clock And the Tarmogoyf, while big, can get chumped pretty effectively by those elementals. But Lucas knows he needs to turn the corner quickly. And, and both those two creatures, both the um, Treetop Village and the Grim Flayer, have Trample. So making them much, much more effective against all the blocking creatures of Martin Eric. Yeah, and this is... Uh this is a smart decision by Lucas because he recognizes that if he just sits around and waits, Martin's going too wide. Those flyers are too powerful. Um, 
you know, Lucas has seven points of trampling power on the table. Martin's at 14. Lucas has a very large Tarmogoyf, a Tarmogoyf that is, you know, I believe it's either a 5-6 or a 6-7 right now. I think it's 5-6, but... Uh I mean, either way, it's getting yeah. chumped, right? But yeah. <laughs> well, the, the interesting thing is, like, do is it time to try and trade off one of those cards? Like, should you get rid of the Grim Flayer to stop the, the the kind of manipulation of the top of his deck? Or should he save one of the creatures so he'll need to chump again with his Tarmogoyf? Um, what's, like, he's basically trying to figure out what is the clock that he's likely to be able to put onto Lucas and still survive what is a lot of trampling damage. Yeah, it's it's a complicated situation, and that's why it's such a good play here from Lucas is he's putting the onus on Martin. Right? This whole, you know, last few t turn cycles, we've been talking about how will Lucas survive, and Lucas finally decided there's no longer a way for me to survive. I need to start asking my opponent that same question. How are you going to survive? Okay, so Martin... It seems likely there's too much damage associated with the Tarmogoyf for not to chump it. So it's going to be whether he needs to actually chump the other two. But if, in fact, he takes seven. Um, so technically, you know, if somehow the Grim Flayer and the Treetop Village get through again, that's lethal, which is actually pretty important. Um, Lucas keeps one card on the top of his deck, putting two in the graveyard. Oh, really, really important. He, he, he decides to cast a Collective Brutality only draining for two, changing the race map the race pretty really, drastically. Yeah, pretty drastically. Like the, it's got, yeah. it's got to be really, really tough for uh, for Martin to actually come back from this. You know, Lucas jumps up to ten from that, and uh, you notice that Martin has six tokens on the board. So now, even if Martin is able to find uh, one of his lightning bolts, it's still not enough to finish off Lucas here. Um, in addition to that. Now, with seven points of trampling power, that means that Martin's going to have to th throw away, essentially, at least three of his creatures and chump that Tarmogoy from the following turn, which means he's only going to be able to attack Lucas for two and leave back enough to block. Plus, he knows that Lucas left a card on the top of his library. So he's going to have to determine what that could be and, how he, and what type of card would be left there and how he would play around it. Okay, so Martin flush, flushes back his uh, faceless looting. Um, keeps a land, so if he kept, he did discard two, so it's possible, I, w I wonder if he actually needs that land the next turn or he just decided that um, it was better in play than in his hand. Um, he's now working out like what he needs to block with to make sure he doesn't die. He probably has to think about what are the kind of cards that Lucas would have kept at the top of his deck that could change the race. What? So what's interesting to me here is that uh, with that attack and with playing the land there, I believe Martin likely has Fatal Push in hand. It right. seems unlikely that there's any other card he could have. Yeah, uh, uh, otherwise everything looks like it's, it's totally lethal. In fact, he, he's basically just, he tried to set up a situation where he was bluffing that and he didn't have anything. Yeah. <laughs> but he, he probably realized that taking the other uh, way he had no chance. So. Yeah. Game two I was goes. He to would have conceded had he not had a fatal push. <laughs> oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> Lucas Seau wins game two, leveling the the match at one one. We're going to get to see a game three of this really really interesting um, matchup because it's kind of you know a mid range deck versus a control deck. I would say my Parliament is kind of this straddling mid range versus control because it has a lot of cards that control the, the battlefield. It's pretty slow. Um, what, how would you, you know, characterize Maru Panzo? Is, is it a mid-range deck? Is it a control deck? Is it something else? Um, I think in many ways it's a mid-range deck. I mean, you are a deck that is uh, disrupting the opponent with discard spells, much like these black-green decks have over the years. And then, you know, you're gaining small incremental advantages with cards like Lingering Souls, uh, Planeswalkers, and Mardu Pyromancer. So I would characterize it as a mid-range deck. Um, it does use its graveyard, but it doesn't overwhelmingly rely on it. Like, if your opponent sideboards in a whole bunch of graveyard hate, you're happy about that because they've diluted their deck to the extent that, uh, you know, they're no longer doing a whole lot. And if they're not doing a whole lot and you're bringing in a whole bunch of, and you have a whole bunch of discard spells in your deck, then usually their deck ends up being really bad <laughs> at doing nothing. So it's a deck that uh, encourages opponents to miss sideboard, to over sideboard at times. 
Um, it's a deck that plays really well post board, and it's a deck that also really preys on creature decks. So if you're playing against decks like humans uh, over the course of the day, those matchups are exactly what a deck like Marduk Pyromancer wants to see sitting across the table. So do you think it's important the, the play of the draw? I know in modern, traditionally, you know, the, the winning the role, play, getting the play or draw is really, really important because getting a mana ahead. This seems like a, a matchup that that's less important. Yeah, I think that this is a matchup where we're likely going to be getting to points in the game where both people kind of have nothing and they're drawing off the top or the, the last threat kind of sticks on the table. Does that mean you, we can maybe see someone drawing this matchup? I don't think so. <laughs> I wouldn't. Would you? I don't, I don't <laughs> think so. I, I think part of the reason is... There's this this concept of, of getting ahead and having your opponent answer your your cards first, mm -hmm. which means that they they basically have to if they don't actually have the perfect answer, if they fall a little bit further behind, it kind of like you know is a bit of a, a roll on effect. But yeah, it's better to be asking the questions than giving the answers. Essentially, also also with discard specifically. I believe that's a Hazaret the Fervent there at the bottom of Martin Eric's hand. Oh, that's a, you know, standard all-star Hazard at the Fervent. Uh, you know, why, why would Martin bring this in? All right, so this card seems great in a matchup like this where all of the removal spells out of Lucas's deck say destroy. None of them are exiling something, uh, meaning that Hazard is nigh unkillable. The other thing is that Martin's deck is very good at emptying its hand quickly, and Lucas's deck is helping him empty his hand. So... Once Martin plays his fourth land, you can bet that he is going to try to stick that Hazard onto the table as fast as he possibly can, and it's going to be really, really hard for Lucas to deal with it. Unless it never gets into play, so... And that's Lucas, ideal, yeah. <laughs> Lucas plays a Thoughtseize out of his hand, taking the Hazard. It's likely there's not too many Hazards coming out of the sideboard, so maybe there's another one. We don't, we'll have to find out. Yeah, and I think that one thing that's interesting here, though, is that Lucas now kind of needs to live in fear of the fact that that Hazaret is in Martin's graveyard because Martin could at some point or another draw a card like Colagon's Command, and when he does so, that uh, Hazaret could come right back to his hand and it could just be an absolute nightmare for Lucas. So, so one thing that happened on the turn two, Lucas didn't actually play a second land. He did draw one on turn three, um, it's one of the things about like playing a you know mid range or control deck. It's very very. It's harder to punish, um, you know, bad mana hands as, as as well when your deck isn't very fast. That's absolutely true. Here, I mean, normally in a game of modern, if your opponent is uh, you know stuck on one land for a number of turns, it feels really really good for you. But you know, in a matchup like this, when one person is just casting thought sees every turn and you have nothing to pressure them with. It doesn't really matter whether or not they draw that second or third land on turn three or four. Okay. Lucas, having cleared out Martin Eric's hand of removal spells, as far as he can tell, feels pretty safe in, in playing now a, a Dark Confidant. See, he knows that up to this point, Martin Eric only has lands. Yeah, now there are a lot of draws out of Martin Eric's deck that Lucas really does not want to see. What, uh, what's the what's the worst one? What's the one that's like uh, makes him slump in his faithless looting? I faithless think. looting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering if a Bedlam Rev Revel would be excellent here too. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it probably would be. Yes, <laughs> Bedlam Reveler is just absolutely one of the best cards against Lucas's deck. Oh wow! Okay, general. so so Lucas flips over a Collective Brutality. The perfect answer to the young pyromancer that's, that's in play right now. Lucas a little bit constrained in mana, but not too badly. Yep. He's going to... Right, so he actually... Uses the minus two, minus two ability, as well as drains for two, knowing that 
you know, one of the ways that, that you can lose a game where he has a Dark Comfort in and out is just to take a little bit too much damage. Yeah, now he has this Nile Spellbomb. Um, after Martin sacrifices this fetch land, I wouldn't be too surprised if Lucas just decided to uh, cycle this Nile Spellbomb and perhaps um, put Martin in a situation where he has uh, less of a graveyard here. Yep, and looks like Lucas agrees with you, removes Martin's deck, stops the Bedlam Reveler top deck from being as relevant. And Lucas, a uh, very dangerous mage. We watched him play earlier in the day today, and I mentioned the fact that uh, he beat me in the finals of like a 400 person PTQ once. I was really sad. He was really happy. Yeah. Look, you know, in hindsight, I'm happy for him. <laughs> <laughs> but not at the time. <laughs> at the time, you were bitter and twisted. No, no, I wasn't, I wasn't bitter and twisted. I was <laughs> okay, so it actually feels like, though Lucas has only three land to, to six, oh, um, we were gonna, I was going to say that uh, Lucas was ahead here. Now, with that lightning bolt, it's possible that... Uh, Martin kind of like stabilizes a little but like Lucas is like I mean does have all spells in his hand because he hasn't had the mana to play them all um, he's been drawing a couple from the Dark Confident itself yeah and I mean it's dangerous though playing against like a deck like Mardu Pyromancer because they can go from having nothing in hand and nothing on the battlefield to having a whole lot very quickly thanks to cards like Bedlam Reveler okay Young Pyromancer from Martin Eric Gautier and then a Mulstrom Pulse flipped over by Dark Confidant, bringing Lucas down to 11. Oh, Liliana, the last hope. Really, really good in this matchup. Just like attacks on many angles. One, the, the minus two, minus one. Kills pretty much every creature in Martin Eric's get deck, barring the, um, the Bedlam Reveler. And is a great grindy card because it can return cards from the graveyard. Yeah, just an incredible card for this matchup. Uh, Lucas playing five Jaces main and an additional one post board. Five Lilianas. Five Lilianas, yes, yes. <laughs> You've got Jace in the mind. <laughs> it's, my mind's been sculpted. <laughs> Faith is looting. A very good draw step there for Martin. Yeah, but I, I'm feeling that it's slipping away. I mean, they really... I, I feel that... Lucas is just, I mean, he has a handful of spells. He's getting more cards from his Dark Confident. There really has to be some sort of backbreaking card that happens from Martin. I don't know if there's a card like Damnation maybe or something like that to kind of like pull it back because I don't think these one-for-ones are going to be good enough. Death Cloud would be pretty Ooh, good. Death Cloud. Oh, <laughs> speaking of not one-for-ones, this is one of the best ones that he has access to. A Colgan's Command. So he returned a... Young Pyromancer. Young, young Pyromancer, but doesn't replay it because obviously the Liliana, the Last Hope, is suppressing that from the, from the board right now. I think it's getting to the stage where Martin Eric's best hope is for some pretty bad flips on the on the Dark Confident. Yeah, I mean, if if Martin Eric can, uh, you know, get Lucas to... Yeah, I, I, no, I mean, he's just... I think he only has one more turn to live. So, right here, it, it seems like there's not much he can do. He really needs to, you know, somehow engineer a double bolt on this turn and then have Lucas hit a three off his Dark Confident. I think that's the only way he can win. Death Cloud time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Death Cloud would be amazing. <laughs> Not that uh, many people are playing Death Cloud right now, but uh, you know it's okay. So th this is a way of like trying to, trying to survive a little bit. So he's able to actually play a Young Pyromancer, and he drew a Lingering Souls. So he's able to flood the board um, with two Elementals, four Spirits, and a Wizard. Lucas flipping Thoughtseize. Not very good against Martin's em uh, empty hand. So Martin's actually was able to 
probably engineer an extra turn here. Yeah, it, it looks like. Oh, never mind. Oh, but yeah, we we actually saw earlier the the, the Maelstrom Pulse, so this is still going to make it really tough. Brutality, and that's yep. enough for Martin Eric. So Lucas Siao comes back from 0-1 to win this match 2-1. Black Green Midrange versus Madhu Pyromancer. Um, we'll be right back with some more magic after these messages. Hello, welcome back to Grand Prix Toronto. I'm Ben Sec. This is Jake Van Loon, and we've seen some pretty sweet modern games this weekend, and it's only really just started. Yeah, I mean, we've already seen like, way over double-digit archetypes. We've seen some really cool games. That game we just watched between the, the Black Green mid-range deck and the Marty Pyromancer deck was 
really back and forth a lot of the time. The game we watched before that of that match was incredible. Just for that, we got to watch a Boggles deck beat a burn deck and you know an all out race. Some yeah, great I mean, stuff. It, and 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 it's it's a format that I mean has gotten a lot of play in the last couple of months because especially having the the lens of a pro tour kind of very recently, you think that the format might have been sorted out. It hasn't been. There's so many decks and no, there's no dominant deck. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think this format is proving itself to be diverse for a very long time going forward. Okay, we're ready to actually go to our time walk match. We've stretched time, space, went into the TARDIS, came back with a match. Pat Cox versus Kirk, Kirk Mahayala. Hope I didn't uh, screw up that, that name. And Pat Cox is on Grixis Death Shadow. And Kirk Mayala is actually playing one of the very successful decks, or at least a version of one of the successful decks in uh, last week. Uh, he's playing Hollow One, but instead of the black-red uh, version that the Japanese brought to the table last week, he's playing a red-green version. So what makes it green? What did he put in the decks to, to, to make gr green worth it? So he is a Vengevine deck. To, to start with, and that's that's the big payoff for playing green. But uh, he's also just playing less of the uh, the full blown random cards like Goblin Lore, and instead he's uh, playing uh, cards like Reckless Bushwhacker or Burning Tree Emissary. So he's able to just completely uh, you know empty out his hand and come out swinging, just kill the person completely out of nowhere. Yeah. So. As you said before, he's a Vengevine deck. So um, Vengevine is one of those cards that really, really helps if you're playing a lot of creatures from your hand. Um, Vengevine is a two green and two, four, three haste creature. Um, but if it's in your graveyard and you've played a second creature uh, this turn, it comes back from that graveyard. And so really, really important, obviously, as you said before, he has creatures like Burning Tree Emissary to, and Reckless Bush Bushwhacker to put them all onto the table, get back a bunch of Venge Vines and attack. Yeah, I mean, tons of one mana powerful spells here too. I think Hooting Mandrels is a card that's a little bit underplayed here. I mean, it does not match up well against the Gurmog Anglers of the world, but against the cards that are good against the Gurmog Anglers of the world, Hooting Mandrels is quite a bit better. The fact that it tramples, it makes it better against spirit tokens, it makes it better against the elemental tokens that are being made by Young Pyromancer. Just uh, a really powerful card. Okay, so Patcock's really, really kind of came out of the gates pretty fast. He has a turn to Gomorrah Gangala. He even has lost enough life to allow for Death Shadow to be in play, albeit as a 1-1. So Kirk is actually playing his Burning Tree sh uh, Shaman. Yeah, so now the uh, the Burning Tree Emissary uh, is the okay. first creature that's going to discard that Venge Vine and that Flame Wake Phoenix. Kirk now has that green mana floating. Does he have another creature to play? It looks like he does. And that's going to mean that he's going to get a Venge Vine back from his graveyard. Um, I think he may also have a Hollow One in play any of this turn. Yeah, this is so going to be a big turn for him. So he's, he's basically discarding, sorry, uh, sacrificing the uh, Neonate, so he gets an extra discard this turn, so he's able to play multiple hollow ones this turn. So he's actually played, that's the second creature he's played this turn, now it's the third, and a Hooting Mandrels. This is an incredible turn. I mean, like, he put like, how, how much power into play? 12, like, 16, 18 power into play, turn 3, and still has a Phoenix in his graveyard that, that's ready to come back next turn. I mean, that is an insane turn. Yeah, that is very, very, very impressive. And that's the major reason you want to be playing this green version of the Hollow One deck is these Vengevine draws are really strong. And uh, they're much better against removal. The deck is also quite a bit better against graveyard hate. Uh, it is, however, less consistent, if you will. And I know that seems odd to say because, you know, you're taking a card like Goblin Lore out but uh, you, know, you lose some of the explosivity that you have with the, the black-red version. Uh, one of the cards that uh, Grixis Death Shadow generally leans on is Fatal Push um, to like, really control the creatures. Um, one of the problems that, uh, <laughs> is that this does not line up very well with this board here. 
This is, um, you know, Kirk only has one creature that can do Fatal Push. I guess he could possibly Fatal Push the Phoenix that comes out of the graveyard. Um, this is not a good situation for Pat Cox right here. No, and, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting, though, that his fish monster, his Grimog Angler, is doing a lot of work here. So Kirk, despite having 18 power in play, only decides to, to return his Phoenix and attack for two. Um, do you think he's being a little tentative, or do you think this is the right way to go? Um, so one of the big problems here is that Pat Cox could have blocked Death Shadow on a pair of hollowed ones, and then Gurmog Angler on the Hooting Mandrels. And because of the way damage works, the Death Shadows would have lived uh, from that attack. That He would have fallen down to, uh, I believe, it would have been like three, and then he would have been able to crack back and kill Kirk with, uh, you know, 25 points of attacking power from Pat's end. So I believe that is correct for Kirk. So despite that draw being so powerful from Kirk, uh, a pair of Death Shadows and a Gurmog Angler really do match up quite well here. Okay. So... And maybe I should explain how Death Shadow works in that yeah, situation, because sure. it is complicated, and it, it, it gets confusing for people who haven't played against it. Um, Death Shadow, even though when it, it was just a 1-1, one, one, when it declared the block on those hollowed ones, which, I mean, it didn't happen, but the hypothetical is what I'm talking about here. Um, it, its power and toughness become the power and toughness of his new life total at the same time. So those Death Shadows would survive that attack. Right, but they deal the amount yes. of damage at the b that they it's were going in. Effect. Yeah. But the amount of toughness they have is the amount of like life essentially on their way, way out. So it's kind of a weird thing. It's like they mm -hmm. only deal like one or four depending if he cracked the fetch land uh, like initially, but at the end they would have higher amount of toughness be because the state base effect of the life total happens before they check for whether the creature dies. That's absolutely correct. So here uh, we can expect one of these death shadow both these death shadows to block hollowed ones. That's going to leave 6, 7, 8, 12 damage coming in at Pat. Um, so Pat's going to need some stuff from his hand in order to survive this. Yeah, it looks like he does have a fatal push in his hand. So he's going to try and figure out what's the best way to block here. So currently the... Um, the Death Shadows are at 5-5s. Five and I think he's going to need something besides just this Fatal Push, though. So he may have maybe a Snapcaster Mage. Flashing back, killing that Burning Tree Emissary. Now he can line up his blocks such that he doesn't have to die. He takes four damage. Mm -hmm. Both hollow ones die. He take, so he goes to four. Um, the Death Shadows are nine nines. Right. They go to nine nines. And so now, really, like, Kurt's in trouble here. Like, he, he's two nine nines, a five five. Um, he basically needs to put at least two, like, two blockers out. Yep. And he just doesn't have it. So Pat Cox actually was able to kind of survive that that final attack. And, you know, really, really shows you just have a little bit of patience. And, and potentially one of the best things about this Grixis Shadow deck is how it can counterpunch after being almost overrun with 20 power of, of creatures. It's crazy. Yeah. Kirk added 18 points of power to the table on turn two or three. Right. That's, uh, it, was, it, it seemed like, oh, well, I guess he got this one. <laughs> And then Pat just, you know, casually played a pair of one drops uh, alongside a fish monster. And sometimes that's all it takes. And one of the interesting things that Pat actually attacked with his 5-5 five five the previous turn, like showing that he knew he needed to actually turn the corner like really quickly because he knew that the, the, the Phoenix was pressuring him in the air. And so he had to get into a position to actually like, you know, win the game. And he was able to do that. Okay, so Kirk opens with a Faceless Looting. Now, discarding a Vengevine, exactly where it wants to be. Next turn, I spy 
some burning tree emissaries in Kirk's hand. I think a pair. So it's very, very likely that the next turn is going to see that Vengevine into play and attacking. Okay, Pat Cox cycles a street race. The life totals are a pretty delicate balance with this deck. It's, it, it's almost a little bit more delicate than the um, Traverse Shadow deck that we were playing before, or we saw playing before. Yeah, I mean, Pat Cox needs to manage his life total in such a way that it's low enough so that he's able to play those Death Shadows, but that it's high enough that he can't just get killed completely out of nowhere. And one of the things that's dangerous in this matchup is the Reckless Bushwhackers that come out of Kirk's deck. Um, Kirk can put a whole lot of damage onto the battlefield really quickly, and uh, Pat can't really say much about it. Yep, we know the life titles need to be corrected. Um, so, okay, so Kirk plays a Stomping Ground. Very likely to have quite the explosive turn this turn. Burning Tree Emissary. Burning Tree Emissary. Triggering the Vengevine from the graveyard. But Pat was ready with his Nihil Spell Bomb. Doesn't quite get the advantage of, like, drawing a card, because, but definitely worth it. Yeah, again there, Kirk on turn two. Even through that Nihil Spell Bomb, which took the payoff out of that Vengevine, uh, he still added seven points of power to the table on turn two. Yeah, he would have been 11. 11 points of power if, he, if, he, if Pat didn't actually have that uh, yeah. Nihil Spell Bomb. Imagine that Flame Blade Adept was a uh, Reckless Bushwhacker. That would have been gross. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. But Kirk is uh, w very low on cards now. So... And Pat's only on 14, so... I mean, still on 14, I guess not only on 14. Yeah, a Delve creature from Pat here would do a really good job of uh, putting him in a situation where he could uh, establish control of this game. An opt from Pat. It's one of the things that's a little bit tough right now. He doesn't want to spin his wheels too much, but he hasn't actually added to the board. And the seven power... On the board is just kind of like Kirk couldn't wait to get into the red zone there, hitting yeah. for seven, bringing Pat down to seven. Like he, Pat, basically needs to have a death shot, like two death shadows this turn, I think, to come back. Maybe a single death shadow and a removal spell, but that's that's going to be even tough. Yeah, Kirk uh, halved Pat's life to the last turn, hoping to deal with that other half of the. He gets to turn back. So Pat's first thing is that he needs to probably play a threat. Technically, getting a removal spell will buy him a, buy him a turn based on the board state. But yeah, now, now the Delve creature would be two turns too late. Yeah, it's just, even with a removal it's spell. Be tough. So Pat sacrifices his Bloodstained Mire, probably getting a basic land at this point because he can't really afford to get a fetch uh, a, a shock land and cast a snapcaster mage targeting basically nothing um, yeah. but giving him a, a chance to block but Kirk has a lightning bolt that is able to finish off Pat and now we go to game three okay this could be I think that Kirk might have mulliganed. We have seen some really explosive draws out of Kirk's deck. Okay. Flame Blade Adept. Kind of one of the more underpowered cards in the, the deck. But despite that, it can actually attack for four turn two. So, you know, it's not that underpowered. Yeah, and I think it's actually better in a deck like Kirk's where you need to be playing uh, a, a bunch of inexpensive creatures to uh, trigger Venge Vines out of your graveyard. Okay, opt. Opt from Pat. Pat didn't have a, a, t a turn one play and he chose to get a Steam Vents. Now, 
I've played a little bit of Chris's Death Shadow, and the way that the mana generally kind of like comes out is that you generally want to get a watery grave first. So getting a steam vents usually indicates you either have all the black shock lands in hand, maybe a swamp in your opening hand. So it's like it's almost yeah. Oh, so or you because usually you you, you want to sequence as many black spells as possible making steam vents not quite as good but I think what he's actually planning to do right now is set up a big delve threat that would make sense it's uh, the perfect card to present right here flame blade adept though does have menace so the two delve threats in Grix's death shadow Gomar Gangala and that's the one he casts, as well as Tassica to the Golden Fang. But, as you said, Jake, can't actually do anything about the Flame Blade Adept this turn because it has Menace. So, Kirk is going to get in while the going's good. First casting is Faces Looting, increasing the power of the Flame Blade Adept by two, discarding a Vengevine and a Bushwhacker. Okay, so he's cycling a Street Wraith, also incre increasing the power of the Adept. Oh, wow. This is going to be great for Kirk. He's playing a Lightning Axe, which actually has the extra cost of discarding a card, which is not really a cost in Kirk's deck. He, he, he basically has added five, like four power to the Flame Blade Adept, and discarded two Venge Vines. So if yep. he has like two creatures next turn, that's got to be crazily good. Yeah, it looks like his hand is Flame Blade Adept Reckless Bushwhacker. Oh, wow. Does he need a land? Does he, he just a needs land? to draw a, th a third land. So if he draws the third land on the following turn, he's going to be attacking for six, five, uh, 16. Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so Pat plays a, a Pyroclasm but he's going to be in trouble if there's a land on top. There is no land, but... but even this, better? This is just <laughs> as bad for him. He's going to play a... Play a Burning Tree Emissary. Play Bushwhacker. It has Surge. The way that the Surge works is, that I believe... I'm not... I'm trying it's to... 14 figure, damage, yeah, yeah. Does it affect the... Um, I'm not sure. If the yeah, it does affect the Venge Vines because they, they come back while it's still on the stack. Okay, so yeah. in any case, it was definitely enough for Lethal. Patcox yeah. going down to Kirk Mayala playing the Red Green Hollow One deck. This is really, really explosive. I mean, I love some Burning Tree Emissary. That is an exciting card. I, I, I'm kind of torn between which Hollow One deck I like. I don't know if the Black, Black, Black Red or Black Green. I mean, Red Green. I mean, there's just so many options. Okay, we're done with round six. We'll be right back with some more magic after these messages.